You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 27, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, a new food allergy, alpha-gal. Our presenter is Dr. Scott Commons. He's in the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at the University of Virginia Medical School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. Uh, today is February 27, 2012. Uh, we're joined this morning uh, by Dr. Scott Commons. Uh, Dr. Commons is at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and he's been involved in identifying and uh, uh, learning more about this uh, new food allergy uh, called alpha-gal. And if you recall last week, uh, Dr. Nicholas, when he was talking about anaphylaxis and the use of epinephrine, briefly mentioned alpha-gal as one of the causes of anaphylaxis that can be kind of mysterious. Uh, we've actually had one patient who had an alpha-gal reaction. We, at least we think it was alpha-gal. He was positive for it. Uh, and so we were very interested to find out more about this new allergy, how it was identified, and and who better to tell us that than uh, Dr. Scott Commons from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Commons. Excellent. So in, uh, in getting the formatter out of the way here, I just wanted to let's see if I can advance, um, go through my, show my disclosure slide here. Um, I'm particularly proud of my up-to-date card, but that is certainly a, a conflict of interest. So um, mm. <laughs> I, I write the card on allergy to meat. Um, oh. So I, I have the talk divided into a few different um, uh, subheadings, and I, I wanted to start with a little bit of background, which most of you may know. But it, 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 the discovery of, of IgE to alpha-gal and, and the subsequent elucidation of the of the delayed food allergy really began in the oncology world. And in um, the late 2000s, um, it began to emerge uh, that throughout the southeast, oncologists were seeing an increased incidence of uh, infusion reactions when using the uh, monoclonal antibody uh, cetuximab. In particular, the groups that UNC and uh, at Vanderbilt were, were reporting this. And, and I have here an abstract from the ASCO meeting showing that this was also happening in, in mid-Missouri. And what, what had uh, appeared was that um, no other uh, places in the, in the country were, were having near the incidence of uh, these reactions. Um, and this is a favorite quote of ours from from Bert O'Neill, who was the lead author on that. And essentially, um, just that you know, as, the story, as the story gets stranger, um, the more he talked to various oncologists. And it was pretty clear that this was a problem that was present in the southeast, but not in other areas. And, and Dr. O'Neill recalls um, this great quote from a prominent colorectal oncologist in New York who said they thought they were lying or crazy. And we, we began to uh, get into this saga about this time because one of Dr. Platz-Mills' former fellows uh, in Arkansas, Tina Hatley, um, was uh, involved in a case um, where the, the patient um, had an infusion reaction to cetuximab, and it occurred on the initial infusion. And so the thought was that this had to be a pre-existing antibody. And Tina uh, spoke with Dr. Plotz-Mills and, and got him interested. And we're fortunate um, in his lab, we have the ability to um, biotinylate uh, various allergens and um, measure IgE to them because we have the immunocap machine uh, in the lab ourselves. So um, the way this goes essentially is that 
the allergen of interest is added with uh, with biotin, and we essentially add it to the solid uh, streptavidin phase, which we we buy um, and are able to create an assay that way. So essentially, we did this with cetuximab to see if we could detect uh, a pre-existing IgE response, um, and this is a a figure from the New England Journal paper um, showing a binding of, uh, of IgE um, to cetux or um, antibody binding to cetuximab in, uh, in sera from uh, case subjects and, and controls. And essentially, you'll see at the, at the bottom left is the, the Tennessee case subjects um, and then other case subjects, mainly from, from North Carolina. The red dots are those who've had hypersensitivity reactions to cetuximab. And you notice that in those uh, far too left panels that all the red dots um, are, or most of the red dots, I should say, are, are above the limit of detection, indicating that there's an IgE antibody that's binding to cetuximab. Interestingly is the, the middle row where it's the Tennessee control subjects, and, and those are essentially folks who are bringing their family members to the cancer clinic. And so they're, as Dr. Platts Mills likes to say, matched for village of origin, meaning they they live where the case subjects live, but they don't have cancer. And, and interestingly, uh, the, that group has IgE that also uh, binds to cetuximab, and that clearly becomes important as we as we begin to tell the story even further. But notably about the geography was that the California and Boston groups had very few subjects um, with IgE to alpha-gal, uh, or at that time what we thought it was IgE to cetuximab. So it, even in the lab, it appeared to be a very regional uh, issue. What we were also fortunate at the same time was that uh, the structure of cetuximab uh, was elucidated. and. Now, this was honestly somewhat news to me. I assumed that we we knew the structure of all of our monoclonals, and that's true to a great extent, but uh, we don't really know the, the glycosylation sites and the actual sugars that are on uh, each of these molecules until they're solved in the laboratory. And uh, we were fortunate that uh, uh, Chen Wei Zhu and his group uh, at the same time that we were doing some of this uh, this work that they were they were knee deep in solving the structure of cetuximab and and what you see from from this slide is that there's uh, the typical conserved uh, glycosylation site uh, in the FC region uh, it's unusual for cetuximab in that that's uh, 297 or, or sorry 299 typically that's um, 297, as you know. But then in cetuximab, um, the, there's two more glycosylation sites, um, one at uh, 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 n linked 43 and the other at 88. The 43 does not appear to be glycosylated, but the, the 88 uh, is heavily glycosylated, um, and that has both uh, these alpha-gal sugars and sialic acid. So as you might imagine, I thought at the time having uh, IgE binding to cetuximab on the immunocap assay and then uh, the structure here solved was to go after what it could be that was actually binding um, in the lab. And uh, we began to work um, to figure out exactly um, what it was. And it turns out um, that of the two sugars, we were able to consistently find that uh, alpha-gal or uh, galactose alpha one three galactose was the the source of the IgE binding. One of the ways that we uh, were able to show this was mclone was nice enough to uh, reproduce cetuximab in a different cell line that did not have the same uh, glycosylation enzyme. So uh, the red box here shows you. Um, a group of patients uh, who reported anaphylaxis to cetuximab, and uh, usually cetuximab is produced in sp2o cells. And you see there on the left, uh, 41.6 going down to 4.2 in terms of uh, the the amount of IgE 
binding that we were able to detect. When they reproduced cetuximab in CHO cells uh, without, I'm sorry, CHO cells which do not have the ability to glycosylate with alpha-gal, uh, we noticed that the, the binding goes away. Um, uh, Scott, one, one additional question. Was sure. the IgE binding able to be inhibited by just adding the alpha-gal to the amino acid? Could you inhibit the IgE binding? Without yeah, the so the, the way we did that um, was to pre-incubate the sera with soluble alpha-gal. And, and that, that works to a large extent. It's quite difficult for us to make the binding go all the way to 0.35. We're better at making the binding completely go away when we add uh, beef, beef thyroglobulin, mm -hmm. which is heavily decorated with alpha-gal. And um, that, it seems that maybe that, it may just be that we have trouble getting enough carbohydrate to really saturate all the sites um, when we use just soluble alpha-gal. But um, when, when we put when we put alpha-gal itself on the cap, uh, I showed you that earlier slide where we can add essentially any allergen or antigen. So if we, if we buy the, the sugar um, that is hooked to, say, a linker, we can, we can add that galactose, alpha-1,3 galactose, to the actual immunocap. And then when we test the serum, um, that way, which is the column here noted uh, galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, there's binding as well when the, when the, only, um, the only antigen on the cap itself is alpha-gal. Um, so we, we feel relatively confident that we've gotten after this several different ways. Um, any more questions about that? No, no thank okay. you. You're welcome. The, uh, so the end, re end result of that, those set of experiments was um, the, the title slide that you see here. Um, and one of the things as we move forward to sort of defining this new food allergy um, was contained within this, um, this New England Journal paper, um, and you see the, the top six uh, patients from, from the prior uh, slide was the, these bottom uh, six patients, numbers 7 through 12, who we had seen in clinic, and these folks had recurrent anaphylaxis, but they, they were not receiving cetuximab. They were not cancer patients. They were simply patients that we had seen in the clinic um, who had, for, for uh, reasons we couldn't define, essentially, they had idiopathic anaphylaxis. Um, and, and it is true that of the of that group um, of six, um, one or two had had suspected beef, um, but we thought, well, wh what do we know about this alpha gal sugar? At the time, we didn't know that much, but it, it turns out that alpha gal is expressed by all lower mammals, and uh, the upshot of that is it would easily be an antigen present on the, the tissues or meat or fat from beef, pork, lamb, venison, goat, you name it. So um, in this, uh, this second uh, table here with, that's outlined in red, these six patients didn't have any, any trouble with, um, with cetuximab because they weren't receiving it. But yet what we see uh, that I've circled in black on the far left is that they clearly had binding to cetuximab um, on the immunoassay and that they also had binding to beef uh, on the far right that's circled. Uh, that you can see there's no binding to FLD1, but there is also to cat and dog, um, consistent with those allergens uh, being um, of mammalian origin. So it, it made a, we, we had a, an inkling early on that um, this may begin to explain uh, some uh, recurrent, uh, quote unquote, idiopathic anaphylaxis that we've been seeing in clinic. Um, even when um, maybe the patients themselves weren't quite uh, expecting it as uh, the beef or pork or lamb was the allergen. So we began to collect uh, these patients in clinic where uh, they had relatively consistent stories 
um, for mainly nighttime symptoms, whether it was anaphylaxis or angioedema or urticaria, the, the common thread early on was that these were usually occurring late at night or even while they slept. And a few of the patients had, had clearly figured out that they were having these symptoms in the evenings after uh, they had eaten mammalian meat for, for dinner. But there were several patients of these 24 who really hadn't figured it out until we um, began to ask questions and they kept food diaries and then um, we certainly ran their sera for IgE to alpha-gal. And so this initial report in 2009 just had, had patients from Virginia and Missouri and um, as many of you know, the, the prick tests, uh, as we report, are often less than four millimeters, but the intradermal skin test is, is usually strikingly positive and the symptoms are delayed. And at that point, I think we had several questions, um, not the least of which is, is this just 24 patients and is it a big, is it a bigger issue or is it quite limited? And then at the time, essentially we were relying on the patient's reports. Some of them did have pictures, but we, we didn't have any clinical documentation of, uh, of any kind of delayed uh, allergic response. So I just wanted to show a, a couple of slides here about um, the structure of, of things and um, essentially make the point that alpha-gal itself, which is the, uh, the middle structure, uh, with IgG written over it, uh, looks very similar to the blood group B antigen. The only difference is that fucose that's linked to the galactose there. Um, and, and we certainly, as immunocompetent humans, we make natural antibodies, so to speak, to the, these various uh, substances depending upon one's blood group. Uh, but we all make a natural uh, antibody, if you will, to alpha-gal. Uh, of the IgG and IgM classes. So um, for uh, completeness sake, I, I love to show this picture of, uh, of skin testing with alpha-gal in case uh, you all do that in clinic uh, on occasion. But uh, what you'll see is that the, uh, on the left, um, or at least it's my left, the, the prick test um, uh, photo, um, you can see the positive response. Uh, and then um, going down from that histamine control, there's uh, beef and uh, chicken, and then lamb, pork, turkey, and then the very bottom, the CO is codfish. And um, what we found in our clinic was that it, it was quite difficult to convince a, uh, a deer hunter that he should avoid beef based on uh, that uh, relatively weak uh, prick test response. And so now we often use these intradermal tests when um, w when we feel as though patients aren't uh, aren't quite um, as convinced by the by that prick test, and we use the intradermal shown on the right. Um, and what we do is we take the we we order from uh, from Greer uh, for our our purposes. The essentially it's the same reagent for the prick test and uh, the beef extract. Um, and that comes 1 to 20. And we dilute that 1 to 20 extract another 1 to 100. So it's essentially a 1 to 2,000 um, uh, antigen that we're putting under the skin there for the intradermal response. One of the, uh, one of the issues that, uh, that I, I spoke about was whether this was um, something that was relatively local uh, or was uh, being seen by others. And, and um, early on, we looked uh, with uh, Dr. Lieberman's help in his uh, Tennessee uh, a group of idiopathic anaphylaxis patients that he'd accumulated. And we were able to find five uh, of 20 where uh, they clearly had uh, some IgE, uh, several of them quite, quite high levels of IgE to alpha-gal. And then we work with Dr. Ray Mullins in Australia, and they're having a similar issue there uh, with delayed anaphylaxis to red meat. And in a, a group, he sent about uh, 20 sera, and nearly half of those were positive as well in, in this 
idiopathic uh, cohort, so to speak. If we look in the Tennessee group specifically, and I just wanted to bring this out because um, sometimes we use surrogate testing uh, in the clinic, or you may you may get a um, a chance to send uh, the more conventional immunoassays rather than than alpha gal. And I wanted you to notice that the chicken and turkey are consistently negative. This is um, again from Dr. Lieber, Lieberman's cohort in, in Tennessee. Um, and we often use uh, beef, pork, and lamb as a as a surrogate for alpha gal. And what I've outlined here in in blue is just to show you that in in large part this can be true. But in this instance, if we hadn't looked at alpha gal itself, the surrogate markers uh, would have essentially been negative, and we probably would have missed that patient. So the lesson is that it's the surrogate markers of beef, pork, and lamb, uh, and, and for that matter, cat and dog, are usually pretty good. But um, for folks that could have a low positive, um, we, may, we may miss those. I also um, mentioned the degree to which uh, the 24 cases that we initially published could be predictive of how many cases were out there. And um, you'll I hope that you'll see this um, figure uh, in uh, in the blue journal uh, before terribly long, but it's available by EPUB now. And I think um, there's there's two issues here that I wanted to to elucidate. And the first is that you can see from the the left um, uh, two columns, and what we're looking at, sorry, is um, IgE to alpha gal on the on the y-axis, and then um, we have our anaphylaxis urticaria subjects that we've divided to cat and home and no cat and home, and, and those are on the far uh, left, and then um, asthma, a group of patients with asthma that we've accumulated um, in the University of Virginia clinic, and then just some, some clinic controls, which we admit freely are not necessarily uh, random controls, but those are folks that come in with a complaint of, say, immunodeficiency, um, or, you know, recurrent sinusitis, something not related to urticaria, anaphylaxis, or angioedema. And then this uh, group on the far right of random controls comes uh, essentially from uh, UNC, from their inpatient service. Um, and so I, I just wanted to show you that there are a lot of patients that have IgE to alpha-gal uh, in this neck of the woods. Um, and interestingly, it does not seem to matter uh, whether there's a cat in home or not in terms of um, whether this raises tighter. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be an effect of uh, breathing in uh, dander from a, uh, a mammal in terms of, of provoking uh, additional IgE response. And also what's interesting um, is it, it really does not appear, based on the, the dots that are red, that the specific IgE is extremely predictive of reactions that include anaphylaxis, meaning you can have a relatively low titer of IgE to alpha-gal and still have ongoing issues with anaphylaxis. So, in terms of the uh, of the food allergy side of this, I, I, I had a few take-home points here, which is just that these delayed symptoms uh, seem to be induced by oral exposure um, to the mammalian proteins in, in folks that have IgE to alpha-gal. And so despite these high titer antibodies, um, there's really no awareness of, so say that, like an oral allergy syndrome type feeling. Patients don't tell us that they have any sense that they're going to have a reaction at the time that they initially eat uh, the food. The anaphylaxis or urticaria or angioedema uh, that occurs after eating mammalian meat uh, often will start with skin itching, um, although that's certainly not always the case. But uh, it is consistently delayed. and um, I use a range here of three to six hours, but most 
patients, or I should say any particular patient, would usually say, you know, Doc, my, my itching consistently starts at four and a half hours after I eat, mm. eat meat. So even though you often see us put a range, most patients have their consistent time. And then we talked about that the skin prick tests are usually uh, less than four millimeters, and the intradromals are often um, slightly larger. So, uh, you know, as a fellow, certainly there was no there was no sense of a delayed food allergy that could be IgE mediated in the literature, um, and and hopefully there begins to be some of that now, but I'm not sure. So, the third chapter here is. Um, what in the world is causing this uh, issue in the southeast? And, and uh, many of you may know that we, we believe that ticks are involved. And so I wanted to show you some of that uh, data. This is um, a map from that original paper by Dr. O'Neill uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where they reported the cetuximab hypersensitivity reactions that we talked about earlier. And those states with uh, that are red were uh, those where cetuximab was, um, where the reactions were incre occurring at increased frequency. Um, this is a map of the places where we had uh, data suggesting there were um, reactions. And, and in many cases, we actually had sera from uh, patients living in, in these uh, places. Um, so a dot on the map is a, is a single case, and then the smaller stars are 5 to 24 cases within a state, and then the larger stars are states where we have documentation of more than 25 cases. And um, unfortunately, this has expanded even more. And so um, Can I this, for a moment? Yeah, please. About maybe 12 or 15 years ago, I worked at Kaiser and HMO in Kansas City here, and I had a guy who had anaphylaxis in the middle of the night, you know, and then one time he told me, you know, I had pork. And sure enough, you know, he had allergic antibodies to pork, and now that all this has come out, it's, it's just kind of interesting. And, and it wasn't uh, immediate, like you said, or, you know, no oral symptoms, and it would occur about six to eight hours afterwards. Very yeah. interesting. Now that uh, this has come up, you know, how, really how long ago was that? Probably find a lot of historical cases of this happening in the mm -hmm. past. I think that's true. We we do have folks that have even come to clinic and said, you know, I've had this for 20 years, and I figured it out, and I'm glad someone has finally written about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Very interesting. So we do find a fair amount of historical cases. So um, the next map here is this. Uh, is the geographical incidence of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We were trying to find things that would co-localize with the place where we were, places where we were having um, reports of reactions um, and the geographical distribution of the cetuximab um, uh, hypersensitivity reactions. And so it seemed as though Rocky Mountain spotted fever was a, a likely candidate and we also came across this map, which is the the geographical range of Amblyoma americanum, and that's the Lone Star tick. Um, and we had tried lots of different um, ideas in terms of thinking that maybe this w was related to a parasite, as as we all certainly appreciate that parasites are good at inducing IgE response. But uh, our best uh, our best guesses with the parasites continued to, to not be uh, fruitful and didn't bear um, enough uh, consistent results. So our thought was that, that perhaps the Lone Star tick could be involved. And, um, this, is, um, th this is the some of the basis for that evidence, which is um, showing a, a, a foot of uh, someone who has been bitten by um, many Lone Star ticks when, when they're tiny, they call them seed ticks around here. But it, it, it seems actually like a lot of patients call them chiggers. So I now routinely ask patients in clinic, have they been bitten by ticks or chiggers? And in the back of my mind, I'm not, I don't really care that they've been bitten by chiggers. I just know that 
a lot of people would say those are chigger bites, and and we think that they're actually seed tick bites, but a lot of folks have no idea what a seed tick is. So I routinely say ticks and chiggers, and I think um, that's actually one of the really good screening questions um, for the allergy. But what I'm showing here is um, the IgE to alpha gal of a, of a patient uh, in 2006 of 0 0.49 a total IgE of 127 and then the fact that both of these go up in parallel um, and uh, multiple uh, bites uh, occurred uh, in this patient in August of 2007 um, so between that May and, and October um, 16.9 to 48 uh, there were there was a significant um, series of uh, of bites as you see on the the patient's foot there. Um, we we have published this uh, in JACI as well, but um, this is essentially time course of IgE antibodies to alpha gal, as well as total IgE following the tick bite uh, episodes, which are highlighted in in red arrows. The blue bar there being total IgE and the black bar being the specific IgE to alpha gal. And um, these are sequential samples, so they're not necessarily um, week by week or, or month, by, month by month, but just uh, sequential in order. Um, and the red asterisk is uh, an episode of um, urticaria that occurred in the middle of the night uh, in this patient. Um, this is a different patient who we've had who we had sequential samples on, and again the red um, red arrows indicate tick bites, and you see that that seems to drive some of this IgE. But interestingly, you don't see any uh, any red asterisks here, and it it seems as though in a few folks when they when they get a significant uh, a separation, if you will, from of the total IgE and the and the IgE specific to alpha gal, that they may not have issues with um, anaphylaxis or hives, um, and you can see that the y-axis is broken there. So, in contrast to the first patient, um, this subject uh, never had an IgE to alpha gal over 10, but but yet had a total serum IgE uh, approaching a thousand. Here's our third subject, um, and I think it makes a, a, a nice point. You notice that the, the y-axis now is, is continuous, um, and the total IgE and the IgE to alpha gal are quite close in value. Um, again, red arrows for tick bites, and then this patient uh, did have an episode of, of urticaria in the middle of the night after having um, pork ribs from Applebee's. The um, the total IgE as compared to IgE to alpha gal, this is um, more evidence uh, that we believe uh, tick or chigger bites can drive this. As you see that the red triangles are subjects who indicate that they have had tick or chigger bites, um, and then a few of the the black triangles where we don't have data. This group um, of black circles specifically deny tick bites. And you'll notice that with total IgE being on the x-axis, these folks have a, a relatively high total IgE. And in fact, this group here circled all have atopic derm. And so I believe that, um, as we all see from time to time, in the face of a, of a quite high total IgE, there may be some background binding uh, to our IgE to alpha gal cap, um, and I think that's what's going on here. So this this group has some IgE to alpha gal, but don't report uh, reactions and deny tick bites. And and they those group that group there in the circle has atopic dermatitis. So um, why why do we uh, why do we think that the amblyoma americanum, the lone star tick, could be involved? Well, in addition. Uh, to that um, distribution, we we would have to hypothesize that something has probably changed. Uh, although there certainly are reports of this um, 
far back 15, 20 years ago, uh, I believe that it, it has become a bigger issue now. Certainly some of this is sort of the founder effect that we're now testing for it, but uh, my sense is it's growing as well. And so one of the things that um, we have come across in the literature is that there seems to be more of this Rickettsia amblyomi, which is a, an organism that lives uh, in uh, Amblyomia americanum, uh, and perhaps the this Rickettsia amblyomi itself has something antigenic uh, that could stimulate the IgE response. Um, so that's a, a hypothesis that we're we're actively trying to test now. I wanted to, um, in the in the remaining time, show you a little bit of. Um, our data about the delayed food allergy itself. Um, we've done some of these challenges both at the University of Virginia and at Duke. Um, this is the first uh, patient or subject that we did at the University of Virginia. And his specific IgE to alpha-gal was 22, and his total was 109. And you see on um, his left hand there, he had a mosquito bite-sized uh, hive. Um, that started to itch, and then he got this uh, second, more plaque-like um, hive on his um, arm about four hours and 20 minutes after eating uh, prosciutto with us. And we treated him with uh, Zyrtec and then observed him for a period of time. He didn't have any progression and, and uh, went home. You can also see that we have an IV in his hand. Um, and so that serves two purposes. Number one is safety, but number two is that with this delay, we we actually were hopeful to try to draw blood and, and figure out if we could tra track mediator um, expression or release uh, in the serum uh, to try to correlate that with uh, the clinical response as well. So what I do is we, we look at basophils um, and I'm just showing you my gating strategy uh, for completeness sake here to uh, convince you that we can identify a nice nice population of, uh, of IgE positive circulating uh, cells that amount to about 1% um, uh, of the cells in the blood. And this, we think, is uh, quite consistent with uh, basophils. And um, just remind you that we're going to look at CD63, which is a marker of basophil activation. And CD63 is, is shown in, in yellow. And it essentially is in these uh, preformed granules with histamine. And when the granules fuse uh, with the outer membrane, CD63 uh, gets moved to the outer membrane. And then we can detect it by flow. Um, and we also uh, have a, so the antibodies are are shown there. We do look for, for 203C, and we can talk about that in a little bit, but it hasn't been quite as consistent for us as looking at CD63 as a marker of activation. So I just wanted to show you a little bit of flow data from uh, the uh, two slides ago, the, the subject um, who had a couple of small hives. And essentially, we're looking, at, uh, looking for double positives to occur uh, that both express IgE and have CD63 on the surface. And then that would appear in that upper right quadrant. I think what you can appreciate is that there's really very little activation that occurs from the baseline through three hours. And then at four hours, um, we begin to see a significant shift of the basophil population to where it expresses CD63. Um, and recall that this, this subject had uh, hives about four hours and 20 minutes in. So uh, despite our uh, sort of less than uh, stellar hives, we were pretty pleased by the, the basophil activation um, from that experiment. Uh, this is another uh, subject. And feel free to interrupt at any time with questions about these. But um, this guy has um, roughly nine units to, to alpha-gal and then a total IgE of 200. Um, and we did the same thing. This is a before picture, um, uh, before the challenge, where we put an IV in and collect blood. Um, 
and he ate uh, 56 grams of prosciutto, and this uh, is pork prosciutto. And then we waited and waited and waited, and really nothing happened. He had a tiny bit of itching uh, in the small of his back and kind of a single hive, um, and he had driven down from northern Virginia with his wife and child, and um, you know we were we were a little bit disappointed as was he because he'd have some pretty severe reactions. And then he actually called me from the road and said that his back was feeling warm and he was driving, but he 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 couldn't really see and um, it was starting to itch and feel warm. And um, he was about half about half an hour um, down the road at that point. And I said, well, when you get home, if there's anything there, just take a picture and send it to me. And um, and he did. And this was as soon as he got home, his wife, who was fantastic, tried to put him in the same position that we were taking pictures in. Um, so this is about seven and a half hours after eating the prosciutto. Uh, he got this rash. And then um, it progressed um, to what kind of looks like boils, but it's hives. Um, and uh, and this is um, these are pictures from their home that his wife took. She treated him uh, with Benadryl, and he went to bed and uh, and did fine. Um, never had any shortness of breath or GI symptoms. Um, just had severe hives and itching. And this is the flow from his experiment. And what you can see is that at five hours we get 8.7 percent, um, and it. It looks as though things were taking off, but but we didn't know, and so I I regret that we didn't have flow from hours seven and eight uh, in him. This is another uh, subject who um, actually had a, a severe reaction, um, and illustrates why we don't take these sort of challenges lightly. But um, she had uh, mammalian meat, and then about almost four hours, just shy of four hours in, began to get um, flushed and itching. Um, and then things progressed for her, and, and we ultimately needed to give her epinephrine. Um, and then the flow from her experiment, um, I expected her activation to be through the roof. But uh, interestingly, she shows some activation at, at four hours, which is clearly significantly different from uh, the prior, um, but it was nowhere near the extent of activation I expected based on her clinical reaction. So I think we're we're learning from this as we go. And um, I only have a few more here. Uh, and this is a before picture from um, a, another meat challenge. And then I wanted you to see that her hands, I hope you can appreciate that her hands are, are quite flushed and, and um, one of them is really taut, um, and this began, her reaction began in her hands, and she was itching some. Uh, she had a single hive in addition to the redness in her hands, um, and then I'm just going to click through these. You can see that the reaction progresses, and she develops significant urticaria on both of her arms. Um, and um, so we she ultimately got epinephrine as well, so we're still learning. Um, but essentially now we have done um, 10 uh, folks that are allergic. Uh, they have IgE to alpha-gal, um, and uh, seven of the 10 got urticaria uh, or more. And then um, you see the time to symptoms. Uh, basophil activation uh, occurred in, in most, and then the time to act time to basophil activation seems to correspond uh, quite nicely to the clinical symptoms that we see. I, I have this slide in because we have to have a hypothesis about why uh, things are delayed. And, and our sense is that perhaps this is related to uh, lipids. And, and certainly the digestion um, of lipids is different from from proteins and carbohydrates, and and lipids form chylomicrons and then ultimately um, traffic through the thoracic duct and into the bloodstream, um, 
and lipids from mammals are glycosylated with alpha-gal, which I have depicted here on the surface of, uh, of a chylomicron uh, in yellow. Uh, so those yellow dots would be my depiction of, of alpha-gal moieties. And perhaps these glycolipids then cross-link um, IgE and, and lead to basophil activation and, and histamine release. Um, this is a, another uh, shot of um, just showing the, the glycolipid uh, side of things. We, we were initially thinking that maybe chylomicrons were the issue, but um, in talking with some lipid chemists and uh, cardiologists here, it may well be that it's a VLDL or LDL um, issue and that there's some additional processing that, that is important. But um, for now, I think this is our best uh, guess at, at, as to why the reactions are delayed. Um, so my, in conclusion, I, I feel like the, uh, the report of delayed reactions um, has now been confirmed uh, on several occasions and, and at both at UVA and at Duke. And clearly in folks with Ig to alpha-gal, beta cell activation in vivo appears to coincide with the uh, clinical symptoms. And I think this suggests that there is honestly a delayed appearance of the antigen into the bloodstream. And uh, uh, these are my contributors. Um, it's a long list, but it takes a lot takes a lot to find uh, patients throughout the southeast. So we we certainly appreciate all who have been helpful uh, in that regard. And I think that's all. I'd be happy to take any questions. You know, just one one note. Uh, Barrett Lewis was one of our former fellows from Springfield, so we'd like to give him. Oh yeah. He was a he was fantastic help um, in, in that initial publication. He was very interested in this. Right. Sadly, he uh, passed away, but um, he was a very nice guy, and uh, we all miss him greatly. Um, one question that I have about the uh, your hypothesis of the antigen being delayed entering into the blood: Can you measure alpha gal in blood to see if that's true? It's a great thought. Um, we have not been able to do that yet, um, but I'm I'm hopeful that either we can or that there's a company um, that has. I think you're going to have to have some sort of HPLC technology probably to do that. But um, we're looking for folks to collaborate with who who hopefully can. Let's see, Brock, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I sure do. Great presentation. Really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm kind of curious as to whether uh, with this uh, uh, blood group B allergen, did, did you look at blood type and, and especially in your controls? And are is that blood type skewed in any of the populations? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, early on we were really we were really into this, and uh, I think we deceived ourselves into believing that blood. A, a patient's blood type may or may not affect the development of the IgE response. Mm -hmm. um, and the more that we've looked at it, um, as we have finally been able to power that analysis, it really doesn't appear that that's the case. Mm. Um, when, when I had, say, 200, 300 samples, I really thought that blood group B and AB were underrepresented, which would have made sense to us, sort of, immunologically that they're too similar. Um, right. So, uh, but when I've not, we now powered it up to about 650 samples and um, unfortunately it seems as though both B and AB are there in the expected proportion. Okay. Yeah, they're, we, they're, uh, just less com they're just less common blood groups in the population. Yeah. Well, we we thought the same thing about latex allergies with the uh, penultimate fucose. Uh, oh, really? Huh. Yeah. And uh, in fact, we, uh, you know, I still think there's something there, but we just weren't in a position to look at it. So yeah. Kind of a, another one that might stick in the back of your mind, you know? Okay. Yeah. Is it, is it always consistent that 
the people are, uh, react to all those different types of meats, or is it more variable where some people can tolerate one but not the other? Do you, do you advise them to avoid all of them, or do you kind of tell them to test it out and see, or how do you approach that? We err on the side of having them avoid all mammalian meat, um, but most folks will tell you that beef is the worst for them. I don't think that's 100% true, but it, and, I, and it may just be that, that beef often is eaten as a, as a hamburger or, or has a slightly more uh, a fat to the cut. Um, and, and folks often will tell us that, that they can tolerate venison if they happen to be a, a venison eater. But, but we know that folks react to venison because we have patients who have had um, or at least report severe reactions um, to it. So it's not safe, even though someone may be able to get away with it. And uh, so we err on trying to, in, you know, impose upon them the safety risks and that kind of thing. The other thing that I, I didn't touch on that, that y'all are certainly aware of is that, um, you know, a lot of this data is in adults, but clearly there are children that have Ig to alpha gal and um, we're working uh, to try to assemble a group of, of, uh, of kids um, because I don't think this is, has hit the pediatric literature uh, well enough yet. So if we find such patients, do you want us to refer them to you? Well, and I know that Dr. Dowling and I have talked to, um, and, and I know that there is a, at least one child um, yeah. there, um, and as we move forward with that, we definitely want to include that case that y'all have found as well. Scott, this is Paul Dowling. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I, was, I wanted to make a comment about your um, your pretty fancy food challenges using prosciutto. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you have Wolfgang Potko for seeing your food allergy clinic. Um, um, but um, I was curious, in the, in the pediatric patients you've seen so far, do you notice any significant difference, like in the severity or or the types of meats or anything between those and adults, or you haven't seen any really difference or not enough numbers? No, you know, it actually seems, and this is sort of this is anecdotal for sure, but the kids that we find, it's it's mainly urticaria. I've only I've only had two um, children where they've had anaphylaxis, and so far we've probably assembled about thirty-five to forty kids. Uh, kids um, here, so my sense is that maybe they're maybe the children are more resilient. I don't know, uh, and, and maybe you're right. Maybe it's what they actually are eating. Um, and maybe it's more hot dog than, well, than the the, uh, the the child that we had um, had anaphylaxis. That was for sure. Okay, um, but he he kind of um, overdosed or. Part of the pun pigged out on barbecue that night before he went to bed. So right. he did a whole bunch of barbecue. Um, yeah. So there may be a dose of that. Maybe yeah. more will cause a bigger reaction. That seems to be true in the challenges for sure. Um, and and I think we're getting better at at causing less anaphylaxis and more just hives based on moderating the dose that we challenge with. Scott, are you for the for the challenges are. I mean, right now you're doing those more for just to kind of prove cause and effect or whatever, but is that something that you you would suggest doing for these patients to do a challenge on them to confirm it? Well, my sense right now is no. I, I don't really do the challenges clinically, to be honest with you. I, I do them, um, you know, when folks are consented and, and it's a fully a research-related thing. I, I think the reason to do it clinically might be if someone tells you that they've been eating beef or pork or, or whatever mammalian meat pretty routinely without having any uh, symptoms, then it's, it seems hard to advocate that they would avoid. Um, and, and we've been looking for those patients to see if maybe their basophils don't react. Um, of course, uh, raises the question of could you desensitize to this antigen as well? Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Even with the like the lifespan, though, you know, is this something you avoid it for five years? Could you outgrow it in a sense, or lose your sensitivity? Looks like the Ig goes up and then down, so maybe it yeah. could be reactivated, though. 
Mm -hmm. um, Brock, you've got your hand up, and we're going to give you the last question because then we're going to have to stop. So go ahead. Okay. I, in your uh, EPUB, uh, you said no asthma. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Why is that? Is that is this a skin phenomenon or what? Well, we do think that skin is the going through the skin is how the IgE response develops. But I, I my our sense is that you you just don't inhale uh, alpha gal. Um, we mm. we put some air purifiers in in folks whose houses have cats and dogs, and we really could not detect airborne alpha gal despite being able to detect cell D1 and CANF1 uh, without any mm. problems. So. I think that's right. very interesting. Well, we're going to have to stop there. Definitely, as they say, food for thought. Um, but we really appreciate this. It's a fascinating story. We hope that uh, uh, you'll come back uh, maybe in a year and tell us what you found out with your ongoing research. Sounds great. Thank you. Luck. So in the meantime, this has been Conferences on Mine Allergy from uh, Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Have a great weekend. I guess have a great week, everyone. It's, it's Monday. And um, we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.